Hi. Hi. It's a nice motley group we've got here. <laughs> um, so I, I, I've been talking about this all the last few days, um, but I sort of want to go into this sort of elongated um, discussion a bit bigger than just talking about what we do, but about what the metaverse is, about the interoperability and about the, uh, uh, the problems with performance as well. And it's a bit broader than what I've discussed before, so, uh, so I shall go through this and we will uh, we'll have a nice conversation, hopefully. So Hadian, who are Hadian, who am I? I'm Matt Kemp, I am a game director at Hadian. My history is in MMOs. I spent 20 years working on MMOs. Um, and Hadian are a deep tech company who have this great technology allowing you to distribute processes on the cloud. So when you've got a whole bunch of MMO people, you've got somebody who says, ah, we can make really big simulations. We obviously want to make the biggest simulation we can. We want to make the metaverse. And we want to be part of that journey to make the super big simulations in the metaverse. So great connection. So first step, what is the metaverse? What is it to us? What do we think the metaverse means? Um, so a bit of a history lesson. In 1969, two things happened. Probably more than two things, but two very exciting things happened. 1969, we landed on the moon. That was pretty cool. Uh, also, three universities got together and said, we want to start sharing our network and start sharing data together. And the internet was formed. And over time, more and more people joined this little network. And then some people from across the pond joined this network as well. And eventually, it turned into the internet that we know and love today. Everybody interconnected, servers everywhere, everybody talking to each other. Right now, this is where we think the metaverse is. We've got people building things. They're not really talking right now, but people are building things and stuff's happening. And we're right at this very early stage of the metaverse. So what do we think the next steps are? The reality, I think, right now is that we're not going to lose the internet. The internet's not turning off tomorrow, it's going to be replaced by a 3D world, which we're all going to interact with. A lot of effort's been put into stuff that's on the internet, and people are going to want to use that. They're not going to want to rebuild everything on the internet in a 3D world. So what we expect to see is companies wanting to connect to a 3D metaverse world, but utilizing their internet experience already. So they'll connect in one 3D world, they'll connect into there, and then link towards their existing internet content. It's low risk. Um, you don't have to rebuild everything you've got, and you still can access and say you're a metaverse company. And over time, people will start to, start to want to have their own metaverse worlds. They will start to want to say, I actually want to brand it all myself. I don't want to be sat next to somebody who I've got no control over. I want this thing to be mine. I want to put it on my hardware so I own the stuff that's going into a metaverse world. But I still want to connect it to my existing internet experience because I don't want to lose that right now. And then they want to decide who they want to connect it to as well. And they make the decisions on who, who the brands are that's going to help them connect, so who's going to help them grow their business, and make those connections that make sense to them. And off the back of this, we'll get networks start appearing. And then more networks will appear. Different people will make different technologies, different networks, and these networks will start linking to each other. And the metaverse will start growing very much how the internet did. So what might this look like? So you've got your internet content. And we think it's going to be something like what we've called a footprint. You have a 3D world, and in there you want to create something. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It could be, I don't know, city block, as you've got here. Or it could just be a shop front, which gives you a 3D access to your inter existing internet content. Then over time, it will get bigger. People will want to build on any game engine. People want to use O3DE, they want to use Unreal, they want to use Unity. I heard rumor of CryEngine coming back. Um, <laughs> who knows? Um, people want to use their own engines, they want to use their own software, they want to use their own data to run these worlds. Uh, all the services they'll want to use as well. So they might, you might want to tie into someone else's ad network. You might have your own ad network. Um, there's all sorts of things that people want to plug in to actually own this world and have their little piece of the metaverse, their own functional part of it. And then the connections happen. And that's the exciting bit. This is where the open standards come in. This is where the open source is. How do we make sure these people can connect, do connect? And then the metaverse is as we want it to be, born with lots of 3D immersive worlds connecting to each other and connecting all that technology and experiences together. So problem one that this creates, how do different networks talk to each other? And I'll dig into that shortly. But first, I want to go into what's the experience in the metaverse? We talk about 3D worlds. 
what do we want that experience to be? When I think about how I want to experience it, and I think how a lot of other people want to experience it, that we want super high quality social interactions. We want to be able to walk through, we want to be able to see people, we want to be able to shake hands, see them smile, see them laugh, see them cry. We want, well, maybe not cry. Uh, we want to see them, uh, want to you know, high five, give them items, have them give us items. Um, we want to do that with people. We want to do that with the AI, the NPCs are running around. We want to understand who an NPC is. We want to know you're definitely a person, you're definitely not a person. Uh, we want to be able to interact with the real world as well. So if I'm walking through, I see somebody wearing a nice pink cowboy hat. Oh, I want one of those. Can I buy it, please? And then it gets shipped to my house. Um, and I want to impact the virtual world as well. I want to be creative. I want to express myself in the way I want to express myself on that world. I want to wear the clothes I want to wear. I want to lose a few pounds. I want to build stuff. I want to make pictures, make music. That is the experience that I want. But we can't do that. Right now, we cannot create a world which allows us to do all that cool stuff. If we use any game engine right now, if you get 100 people in it, you're lucky. The more you want to do with those 100 people, that number goes down. The compute is not available on any machine to allow us to create a metaverse world, and that's a problem. Problem two. How do we supply the needed compute to realize our metaverse vision? So let's go back to interoperability. Let's talk about that. So why is interoperability important? Because if we don't have it, we'll have a segregated universe. And the worlds will operate in isolation. This isn't the metaverse. The metaverse is about being interconnected, about being connected. If we don't do that, the metaverse just ceases to exist. So we've got to be interoperable. So what do we need to do to be interoperable? There's a whole bunch of technical stuff that we have to do. We have to think about how do digital assets flow between different worlds? How does user data flow between different worlds? User wallets, hard, all this stuff has to be thought about. Ad tech, how does that work across different worlds? Um, content built in different game engines, how do you walk from part of a world which has been made in Unreal? And without missing a heartbeat, without any interruption in your experience, step into a world which is made in Unity. How do we do that? That's, that's, that's a problem. But it's not just technical problems. It's temporarily technical problems, right. So here's, here's a few more things about um, uh, just sort of tip of the iceberg stuff of all the different things that you, could, you have to think about. So assets, 3D formats, animations, IP permissions. Do you have in one world the same permissions to use someone's intellectual property that you do in a different world? How's that managed? How do you move that across? If I'm walking from one world to another, I want the experience the same. Suddenly, I cannot wear my pink cowboy hat. Disappears. That's not, that's not the experience we want. Sound formats, physics interactions, you know, size of files, all these things we've got to think about. And the data as well. So I know where I am in one world. I know what my position is in that world. I know what state I am. I know what functionality I've got. Again, if I step into another world, how does that move? Can that move? How do we make that interoperable? Does that world even have the licensing to use the software that I need to make this world work? To make that transition from, here's my position, into the next world of, I, cannot, I don't understand what that means because I don't have that licensing to use that piece of software. And again, hardware. We're going to be running on multiple machines. What are the requirements of those machines? What protocols do they use? What are the bandwidth requirements? All sorts of stuff we have to start thinking about and what needs to be interoperable. It's not a simple thing. It's every layer has to be interoperable and work. And now it's not just about technology. It's also about society. So if I'm in the metaverse, I have this wonderful, engaging world. No device that I own, no phone, no computer will hold the metaverse on it. So what we have to be doing, what technology companies need to be doing, is changing what's on your computer to allow you to view the metaverse in the way that you want to see it. And we can't do that by having hundreds of screens pop up to say, please accept this piece of software we need to download. Please accept this. Please read through this Euler agreement, which you're never going to read anyway. So we, we need to create trust with the end user to say, give us access to your machine. We are going to give you the data you need. We're going to give you the software you need to make that experience seamless, enjoyable. And that is a massive society change. Look, at I mean, I'm, I'm a gamer. I assume there's many gamers in here. Um, how many companies do you trust access to your computer with? None. 
that's the size of the problem. This is a, a super huge problem. I've also got problems with how people use my personal data. One example, I um, decorated my uh, living room last weekend and I wanted to put my Xbox on the wall. So I found a company that made Xbox mounts to put on the wall. I ordered it from them, brilliant, arrived two days later, put it up on the wall, Xbox looks great, sat on the wall with all the controllers around it, it's very nice. Um, two days later I get an email from them saying, oh, did you know we also sell this? Now I know, I never clicked that button that said you can market at me, but they still did it anyway. And if this is the sort of stuff that goes on, then that trust is getting eroded between the end user. I don't trust what you're gonna do with my, my data, so why would I give you free access to it? Because I don't trust you. This is another society shift. We need to make sure that companies are protecting our data and we start trusting what companies can do with our data. And then obviously security is the obvious next big step. So who's, who's gonna succeed in the metaverse? From my point of view, the company that creates trust with the end user is gonna succeed because they're gonna get more data, they're gonna get more data about the customer and they can use that customer and that data to make their products better and succeed further. Business models, that's the other big problem. Right now, if I am a big company, I have a bunch of IP, I have a bunch of technology, that is valuable to me. Why on earth would I give away that value to other people for some promise of this utopian thing we're going to create? Some people are bought into this and are doing it. Many aren't. And until we can find business models where people can understand, actually, if I'm going open source, if I'm going to share my technology, that I can make more money doing this. Once we get to that stage, then we're gonna start seeing this change quicker. But this is beginning to change right now. You think about Fortnite, for example. People are putting their IP into the hands of lots of um, uh, <laughs> sweaty 13-year-old sweaty uh, kids playing Fortnite, um, and it works for them. And this is, the, uh, this, is, this, is, this is beginning to change. So this, I don't think, is as big a problem as the previous ones. But again, business models is what's gonna drive uh, people going into the metaverse and companies going into the metaverse. Because if you can't make money from it, you don't understand your business model, why on earth would you give what's valuable to you away? And we need to start helping with those changes. So problem number two, performance. So why is performance a problem? It's quite simple why performance is a problem. The amount of compute needed to run a simulation, if that is more than one machine can give, then we have these problems. So we have the decreased accuracy and interactions. We have the increased lag and latency, and we have server crashes. And the way we deal with this right now, in any game, we decrease the amount of participants in that simulation, we decrease the fidelity, we decrease the functionality, and increase these isolated instances. That's our solution now to this problem. And this is not the metaverse. This is the complete opposite of where we need to be for the metaverse. We need to turn this on its head and start solving these problems properly rather than just putting mitigations in place, which is moving us further away from what the metaverse needs to be. So I'm sure some of you have seen this already. I, we have a solution, or we have come up with a solution. It does not have to be the solution. There'll be other solutions that come out there as well. But this is how we're solving the problem. We're solving it through distributed computing. The way we do this is we take a map, no matter what it's built on, whether it's O3DE, whether it's Unreal, whether it's Unity, we take a map, we divide it up into squares that we call cells. Now each cell, we put a piece of compute uh, on that cell, uh, which is effectively a core, could be a machine, could be an entire data center if you wanted to, um, on, into each cell. And then what we do is we dynamically split these cells based on the amount of compute that's required in any one space or any one time. So if you look at the city up there, um, that's where all the action's happening. That's where everything's happening. A huge amount of compute's needed to process what's going on in that city. And underneath, you can see lots of small cells, lots of cores and computers going into that area. If you're standing on top of the mountain, um, there's not a lot going on up there. You've got some snow, a tree, a yeti, and nothing's happening. You've got big, big cells, small amount of compute. You don't need that amount of compute up there. And this solves the problem. This solves the problem of getting more users in, getting better interactions, and your higher fidelity things as well. This, this is a solution to the problem. But it brings its own problems. And the problems that we have beyond this is, if we're running on multiple machines, how do we move data between those machines? How do we track, uh, how, how do we split and merge that data as well? And how do we keep track of all the machines that has that data on? So imagine you've got a simulation with 100 machines. That's 6,400 uh, cells in that. Each cell 
is part of the simulation. Each cell is related to a part of the simulation. How do you make sure the data knows where to go? From what machine is that piece of data on? Where does it go to? Um, that all needs to be sorted out as well. And then uh, how do these different solutions talk to each other as well? So the way to think about this is boils down to data structures. So there's four different places you can process and keep data. You can keep it on the actor, which is the smallest thing in the simulation. You can keep it at a core. Does every single core have a piece of data on it? Does every single core process that piece of data? Uh, what about machines? Instead of on every core, do you have it on every machine instead? Does every machine have a, do you use this data? Does it process that data? Or do you do it in the data center? Is there a machine dedicated to doing this one thing in every single data center? Now, the most performant way of doing it would be to stick it all on the actor. Everything stems up from the actor. The actor is the thing that has all the information and needs to do it. The problem you've got is if you put all this data on an actor, you've then got to move it across machines. So if you've got somebody standing on a cell, they move into another cell, the, the, the core might be on a completely different machine, might be in a completely different data center. You could be moving this data halfway across the world. And that's expensive. And if you think, I'm standing on a border of a cell, and I'm crossing it 10 times a second, you suddenly got to move this data 10 times a second as well, 10 times the cost. So it's not straightforward as all data sits in one place. And the way we look at it is the more performant the data needs to be, the closer it needs to be to the actor so it will sit on the uh, core, potentially the machine. If it doesn't need to be super performant, then you can push it up into the stack higher so it can go into the data center. But of course, as you go down, the more performance stuff has to be duplicated more often. But the simulation isn't just the only thing that makes the metaverse work. You have the main simulation, which has people moving around, but you have all the other stuff that makes it work. You have your voice chat, you have your physics uh, libraries, your billing services, player databases, loads and loads of stuff. I mean, this is just the first five things that popped into my head. Um, and we're not talking about 10 people in a simulation, or 100, or 1,000, or 10,000. We're talking hundreds of thousands. We're talking millions. So the amount of compute you need to process any of these uh, services could easily be more than a machine. And for that, you need to start distributing these services as well. One machine that runs your physics library is not going to be enough for 100,000 people. So that needs to be on 10, 100, 500 machines. Next question, how do you split the simulation? Well, the simplest way is let's do it by people. Where are the people? When they start moving into the same cell, you can say, ah, we'll split that simulation. Uh, but that doesn't always work. If, for example, you've got a simulation which has lots of physics interactions, lots of AI in there, one person may trigger that. Uh, so you could have 100 people in one cell working absolutely fine, but if you've got one person triggering a whole bunch of physics stuff, it might crash your simulation because that cell just cannot cope with the compute. So you need to start thinking about what are the metrics that are important for a simulation in order to understand what compute uh, requirements you have and therefore when to split the simulation. You can even go a step lower as well. You can start thinking about the core. What is the performance characteristics of the core that that, that cell's running on? If it hits 60%, 80% of uh, the important metrics for you, do you split at that point? And every simulation will be different depending on what this 3D world will want to look like. And then we have the other problem. So we have this wonderful distributed system. We have simulations, um, data flying around this multiple uh, uh, distributed simulation across multiple machines, across multiple data centers, but it takes time to get that data back to the end user. You get lag, you get latency, that's not a good thing. The experience we want is somebody moving through step by step, uninterrupted, high quality simulations. So how do we deal with this? We deal with this using edge, edge servers. So we have an edge server on the edge, obviously, uh, next to a whole bunch of users. We know who those users are. We know where they are in the simulation, which means we don't have to send the entire simulation to them. We can take that and just put the simulation, the parts of the simulation we need on that edge server, and then process some of that data on the edge server as well to make those interactions super, super quick. And then we can send the deltas back to the main simulation, make it all make sense. We've always got that single source of truth of what that world looks like. Um, there's other things we can do across the back of that as well. Sitting on the edge server, we can do interest management on that. So to make sure that there's, you don't see anything you don't need to see, we can do the computing on there as well, so we can actually run a whole bunch of compute on there. Does, is there basic physics interactions we can do on an edge server rather than necessarily send it to a physics library machine? Event handling as well, make sure only the events that are necessary 
can flow through, reduce the costs of bandwidth. What might this look like? So this is a this is a, what we're really working towards at Hadian, what we're trying to build, and what we've dis, we've called a Hadian world. This is the, a scalable three D world, and in the side you've got your internet connections come in with a via APIs or via SDKs in order to build the world and the, the, your footprint in that world the way you want it to look. You've got all the connections you can make as well. So you've got your ad networks, your voice providers, your data insights uh, programs, all the stuff that you need to make your 3D world work. Then you've got your connections to your decentralized technology. So blockchain, IPFS, plug into these things. How do they work? How are we going to utilize them in the future? So they sound very exciting pieces of technology, but we're still not quite sure what the best way to utilize these things are. And then for this group, the most exciting bit down the bottom, the open standards. How do we make sure these worlds talk to each other? And that's going to be the exciting part. These different protocols that people are going to come up with, the different ways of storing data, the different ways of moving data. How do we make sure these worlds can talk to each other and become the metaverse that we want it to be? So conclusions. The metaverse has got to be interoperable. I don't think there's anybody who disagrees with this. Uh, to do that, we've got to have open standards as well as social and business model trust in order to make it truly interoperable. And if we want to deliver the end user's expectations of the metaverse, we have to distribute simulations. There is not one machine we can do that. We have to do this. And it's got to be across multiple machines, whether that's on the cloud, up for debate, but it's going to be on multiple machines because not one machine has the compute power to make the metaverse a reality. Thank you very much. Ah, uh, yeah, I guess. Oh, go on then. Right, we're talking about internet, internet, you, if you use that kind of terminology. So we have one big metaverse world, but then each each region or pocket, you can have your own metaverse? Yeah, is I mean, that... think, think of it like this. This is the internet. Yeah. The internet's got lots of nodes all over the place right. where things happen. And we expect it to be the same. We expect to be, there will be a metaverse world somewhere which is hosted in lots of different places across the world. And you might have a metaverse world that I only want to allow um, I don't know, a gaming metaverse world. There's a whole bunch of games I know that are my friends, and I don't want anyone else to come into it. This is, this is my world that I've built. Uh, Ferrari may want to build a world, and it's going to have lots of Ferraris you can drive around in and race tracks and things. And they might want their own world that they connect to their uh, current internet things. You might have uh, a banking world, a finance world, um, where financy stuff happens. And um, yeah, but but I can only have one identity. I can't have an identity for banking, mm. identity for Ferrari club, because you know I I'm one person. But when I'm dealing with banks, I like to use this identity. When I'm dealing with Ferrari club, I want to use a different identity. I mean, but today, but the whole three days, people are talking about one identity. Yeah. So that part I don't get. Can we have multiple so, identities? I mean, it, it depends how the world wants to work. Yeah. And okay. if, um, if you want to create a metaverse world and force people into having an identity just to get to that world, then a person could do that. Um, do we want to do that long term? No. Hence why the blockchain stuff on the, the side there might be the solution for that. Uh, might be the ID, single ID that runs across the entire metaverse. Okay. Um, but equally, you might, might want your own separate one. You might, you might want three. Okay. So do you think, so sorry, just one quick, quick question. Do you think the cloud service providers will play a key role in enabling uh, metaverse worlds? Or do you think that um, you, know, you can just build it from scratch? Um, I think you can't, do, you can't make a immersive world without distributing it. And where's the easiest place to distribute compute? That's the cloud right now. So our solution works on the cloud. It's designed to work on the cloud. Um, people may start making their own data centers and doing it themselves in the future. But for right now, the next step, the solutions we've got out there right now, the cloud, I think, is important. Now, the interesting thing off the back of that is, does the type of machine that's available on the cloud change? Because at the moment, you've got lots of very good compute machines. 
but the ones that we find most useful are the ones that have good um, communication speed. So to suddenly that profile shift, that's a, another interesting conversation to have. Sop. No, actually, the, the follow-up question, or the question you just started to touch on, is the issue that we don't have the right machines or they have enough compute capacity, or is it that those machines are so inaccessible, whether it's because they're too expensive or they're, they're too big or they're just... There's, there's not enough. Basically, yeah, there's, there's not enough. Uh, we struggle to find the best machines that we want to find to run the best way of doing it. Um, and, and that will change, I think, over time as we move more to the cloud. Cool. Anything else? One more philosophical question. If you scroll back to That one. So when I look at a, at a diagram like this, it, it all looks sequential. Mm -hmm. it, it is the trick in distributing the type of machines or the compute capacity in a way whereby it's, for lack of a better term, more evenly balanced or distributed, meaning put the instead of sending things back and forth, can we turn the network itself into the compute capacity? That's effectively what we're doing. The issue you've got is um, speed of light, because it takes time to send something from here to here. And it takes time to send something from here to here, so then it's from here to here, and then from data center to data center. And this is effectively the limitation that we have. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to speed up the speed of light, that makes my life a lot easier. Cool, we're all good. Yeah, you go for it. Um, we can use what we've currently got, so your, your key UDP and TCP um, yeah. are ones we can, we can, yeah, we can still use those, and that's what we've got right now. So if you want to build this anytime soon, we've got to use what we've currently got. It may well change and alter in future, and some better things may be created, and I hope so. Yeah, and again, it's a learning thing. You know, this is what we think we need to move towards. Um, it will change. We will have new ideas. And, Yeah, it's happening already. Yeah, it's happening already. You look at um, Sandbox, that's effectively it. Build your metaverse in, I think. Uh, Sandbox or uh, Decentraland, that, that's what it is. This is uh, they've positioned themselves as here is the metaverse. You build your metaverse here. That's their solution. I think it's going to go beyond that. Um, but people, I, I fully expect there to be a metaverse as a service um, uh, industry appear off the back of this. Yeah. So, I mean, take, take for example, uh, a retailer, take um, Walmart. They might not have the people with the technical ability to build this. They may be able to employ a whole bunch of unreal people 
um, in order to create a world that makes sense to them. And then they just want to stick it on top of the technology and make it work. Um, the deep tech, that stuff they might not have. And if I'm, a, if I'm a retailer, why would I want to spend money on employing a whole bunch of really technical people to build a metaverse world if there's a turnkey solution out there that says, ah, we'll just get the basics people in. Let's get it done. Let's get it built. Everything plugs in, works nicely together. And this is what we're doing here. Like this community, we're trying to build some open standards for payment, for identity, yep. you know, communication, all those stuff, all those stuff, right? And then you can package them as that. Yes, I think that's. I think that seems a, a way we'll end up going here. Yeah. yeah. It makes it more real to me now. <laughs> good. Good. The internet is now, or the metaverse is now more real to one person. That's, that's, a, that's a win. <laughs> Beautiful, lovely. Thank you very much.